Welcome to everybody again. We are Cristiano, I'm the lead AI scientist at Pi School, and um, I want to present you this tech talk organized by, by Pi School. And today is, uh, is a pleasure to host uh, Adrian Buzzatu. Adrian has uh, played a leading role in the particle physics data analysis that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson during his PhD at Fermilab. I strongly remember that time because I'm a theoretical particle physicist and I was doing my, I was starting my PhD uh, when the Higgs boson was, was discovered. So I was uh, super excited <laughs> as a theoretical particle physicist. And um, so I said uh, uh, during his, 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 his PhD at Fermilab and then his postdoctoral research at CERN in Geneva. Um, switching from academia to industry after his postdoc, or several postdocs, I don't know, maybe you can tell us more later, Adrian. Um, Adrian has been building for five years complex data products at scale uh, at startups in Berlin, based on uh, sensor data processing, machine learning forecast for geospatial data and time series. Uh, today's presentation, if I understood correctly, will be divided in two parts. Uh, the first part, uh, Adrian will present his experience as a physicist analyzing a large quantity of data, such as at CERN and in general in experimental particle physics, uh, where statistic, machine learning, optimization, and data pipelines really are playing together at once and are playing a key role together. Uh, the talk will then continue to present the experience and learning uh, from uh, transitioning from academia to, to industry, in particular to startups uh, for, for Adrian. The talk will end with, uh, with an example of a complex data product from tire mobility, where the fleet operation optimized at scale. So again, uh, welcome. Thank you, Adrian, for being here. And uh, we can start with, uh, with the talk. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here the kind introduction and i'm looking forward to talk to you about my uh, trip at cern and fermilab into this world of elementary particle physics where i had the opportunity to be part of the discovery of the higgs boson and in the process learn the topics that we call in the industry as data science i will try to share some learnings along the way mostly from a perspective of statistics, how it can be used to really know which of the insights are actionable or not based on the data and how to do that at scale. And therefore we can make an impact either in the academia or in the industry. So I will indeed talk first about the Higgs boson at CERN and that will be a look into the analysis where we discovered the Higgs boson decaying to two bottom quarks, which was my topic for 12 years, five years PhD and seven years postdoctoral at different laboratories, Fermilab and CERN, different institutes, several uh, postdocs, but together they have the same theme. And from that, I think we can learn some simple rules about statistics that can be applied to the industry as well. And that would be my message uh, to take home, of course, ending with an example from our products uh, at TIA. So to start with the academic part, here is the Higgs boson topic. So this is Peter Higgs on the left side, looking at a poster that I was presenting in April, 2012. This was in Aberdeen in UK. I was just starting my postdoc at Glasgow University as part of the Atlas experiment at CERN since November, and there was a summer school. And he joined because he lived nearby. He's a professor in Edinburgh, so all our cities in, in Scotland. He had predicted the existence of this particle that we call the Higgs boson in 1964, along with Francois Englert, who predicted what we call now the, the Higgs field. And he was waiting for 50 years for the answer if that particle truly exists or not. After my PhD that I started around 2007, master around 2004, 
I was working on this Higgs boson and together with other teams at Fermilab, we put together the analysis, we combined them and reached evidence for the Higgs boson. And that means three standard deviations or three sigma. And I will elaborate more in the talk later today. And of course, he knew about the paper already published, but, but he was uh, keen to, to see the result in the poster, how it suggested that the Higgs boson exists and it is here. But it was just an evidence for, it was not a full proof. The full proof actually came only a few months later, in July 2012, from CERN, I was uh, from CERN, the laboratory I was just joining, but from another branch of the analysis. And the Higgs boson was discovered, that means beyond a doubt, that means five standard deviation. And I will mention later what that means. And because of that confidence, he was awarded, together with François Angler, the Nobel Prize the following year, in December 2013. The theme of the talk is actionable insights so that they can have an impact. Which action should I do, which I should not do? Such a way that you have an impact. And giving a Nobel Prize to somebody is a big impact. So it has to be motivated really by statistics, right? This three to five standard deviation. And I will elaborate on the next slide. How are they calculated? What do they mean in terms of probability and risk? that you take. On average, at big scale of measurements, if you measure the average mean mu of a sample, you obtain a Gauss distribution. Gauss or bell curve represented here is a standard most famous distribution that we have. And the important is that this distribution has also an error not noted here with sigma or standard deviation. So the distribution of the, of the mean gives us a feeling of how wide this distribution is. In other words, how likely it is that a real value is far away from the measured mean or not. And on this diagram, we see that, for example, if we have 10 euro revenue in a company and you have an uncertainty of one euro if you go at a one interval below and after between nine euro and 11 euro you have 68 probability to be right but you have one third probability to be outside that so one third probability to be wrong and maybe your manager does not want to act on one third probability they want to be more confident and they say well what is the confidence interval of two standard deviations or 95 percent so then you say 10 minus 2 because you have two standard deviations 10 plus 2 from 8 to 12 i have confidence of two standard deviations so basically you say 95 percent of the time i should be right if my revenue should be a, at least eight then you say okay that's reasonable and then you can plan eight euro in your budget instead of 10 just to be confident but maybe you want to be even more confident. And then you say, I want three standard deviations, which is represented here. And then you have a chance, basically one in 1000 to be wrong. Now, this is very likely, very confident. You could do a lot of things in real life already at 95% confidence. And that's what most industry is, 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 is working on. And that's where the p-value of 5% comes from. But if you want to be really, really confident, you go to three standard deviation. But in particle physics, even that is not strong enough. That's why we say it's evidence for. It's when we start to look into that with interest. It's when we start to believe it's likely it's not a random fluctuation. But we don't go to discovery until we are here at five standard deviations, which has a probability of being wrong of only one in one million. So going from evidence is one in 1,000 to one in 1 million. And that's what you need for CERN to prove that a particle exists. Because these particles are key building blocks of the universe. And they can change our whole view of the universe. And especially the Higgs boson, 
which is a different type of boson than the other bosons that we knew, W and Z bosons, and without which we wouldn't exist. The topic about the Higgs boson can be a topic of its own. So I will stop around that and focus on the numbers that the impact is so big that you really need to trust your confidence. So you really need to make a measurement and know if it's two sigma, three sigma or five sigma. This is when you make a measurement in science. But this is also true when you make a machine learning prediction in the industry. In our day-to-day -day life, for example, me, Atia, currently, I make forecasts. And with this forecast, there are point forecasts, a number. But to act on them, you need to know the uncertainty around it, like in this diagram, to tell the management and the operations people, can you act on this or not? Do we trust this? estimate of revenue if you make this action or not so therefore it's very important to think in terms of uncertainty confidence interval and learn how to measure that for for a sample or how to estimate those for a machine learning prediction because with that you empower your decision makers which are the business manager the c level of the company to know if they act on that or not but it's also important for your career because you are the first one who measures that. You don't wait for somebody else from business to estimate it. You will do better than them. And you want to work on something that is crucial to the business, without which the business would not operate. Not something that is nice to have, that can be cut when times are tough financially. And if you measure it yourself, you can report it to your manager in a nice presentation with data storytelling, and then you can influence without authority for the peers and your stakeholders to act on it. And then you can be successful in the company, both in your CV and in your career. You can ask for a promotion or a salary increase because you proved that you brought revenue and you showed that with confidence interval. So it can help your career while helping the company and hopefully on a theme that makes the world a better place. And when we talk about data, the data is the new oil, the new gold. It's the source of revenue and the source of strength. It comes by analyzing the data. And we have advanced a lot in data analysis from dashboards to machine learning predictions to optimizations with constraints. But really what's the next level of confidence comes from the statistics and the uncertainties and this is the message i want to bring in this talk and i will elaborate exemplify on this higgs boson discovery how that was done with very simple statistics that only has arithmetic so that we can take those formulas two formulas to take on with us in the industry and we can make these calculations directly in our mind so i'm not talking about fancy t-test with calculations just intuitively how to use yourself and your managers to decide right away if something is actionable or not. To understand that, we will go a little bit through the accelerator and the detector to understand what we are doing. The accelerator at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, is the most precise microscope in the world. We can make an analogy with biology, and it's a true analogy. This circle is 100 meters underground, 27 kilometers in circumference under Geneva, in France and in Switzerland, near the Alps and the, Geneva, and the Lake Le Mans in Geneva. We collide, we accelerate to the speed of light, and we collide two protons, beams of protons, one way and the other way, such that they collide 40 million times every second. We can only blink six, seven times, but it's 40 million times. It's faster than any digital camera we have. That's how fast it is. It starts from something small, a bottle of hydrogen, and then it gets the protons out, they get accelerated here, it gets accelerated here, so it's an entire accelerator center. But in four points around it, you have these collisions. And this is how it looks inside. You use magnets to put the particles on a circle and you use the electric force to accelerate them closer to closer until only the speed of a walking person is missing 
relative to the speed of light. When these collisions happen, some new particles are produced, such as the Higgs boson. But these particles are so massive from this high energy that they decay right away. They disintegrate. And the daughter particles also decay right away. And the granddaughter particles are those that we see in the detector, such as electrons, muons, photons, quarks. And these particles pass through the detector that has different layers, different colors, optimized for different particles. It's a digital camera because it acts digitally with electronics to be able to do it 40 million times every second. And it's 3D because, as you see, it goes in all dimensions, including here at the end, it has some caps to detect particles that go through here. When the Higgs boson is produced, it creates an image like this. This is a real image of a candidate. You never know if this one was the Higgs boson or not. You can measure statistically, so again, uncertainty and statistics, that in our sample we have enough Higgs bosons, as the theory predict, and you can say that this is a very likely candidate, but you do, cannot know. Could have been a, a simulation, could have been a background looking like the Higgs boson or the actual Higgs boson. But it has the features, and the features are that one particle came this way, one particle came the other way, and they collided here in the middle, producing a stream of particles in all directions. Some particles are not interesting, a bit of, a bit of noise in the image, but when the Higgs boson is produced, it's very energetic, and it decays to two particles. And because the Higgs boson is so massive, when it decays to these two particles, they go in opposite direction. One particle goes this way, and this is called a W boson, and one particle goes um, this way. So they are produced back to back. The Higgs boson and the, and, the, and, the, and the W boson are produced here back to back. And the Higgs boson decays here in our case, in our analysis, to bottom quarks, which are daughter particles. And you see they go together, and they make a shower of particles that go in the same direction, a stream of particles represented here by these two things. Whereas the W boson decays to a muon that we see in red, and the neutrino, the little neutral one, that does not interact with anything in the detector. So therefore it appears as missing energy, and is represented in the dot white line. Like in a billiard game, where you strike at the beginning the balls, and they go in the direction, in all directions, and if you measure the direction and speed of every particle, of every ball, you can calculate by conservation of energy and momentum what was the energy of the original particle and energy is mass we know from einstein so basically we measure we estimate the mass of the original particle and that has been simulated it has been pre predicted by the theorists of different values and then it's simulated and therefore we can see if what we saw in the detector is consistent with the simulation or not so basically we can already guess that the best variable to distinguish signal and background is if this mass of these two blobs that look, look like bottom quarks, we are made of quarks, the protons and neutrons are made of quarks, looks like the mass of the Higgs boson. So if we are to distinguish between signal and background, we already have a candidate for a simple analysis or for machine learning that would use these variables together with something else. And indeed, if we make a plot of the invariant mass of these two bottom quarks, we see here that there is a curve. Colors represent simulations, so that means theoretical predictions, and black means really what the data tells us. The Higgs boson, which is our signal, is represented in red. And you see that it has some small tail, and it has a peak around 125. And indeed, that is the mass of the Higgs boson. It's 125 times the mass of one proton. So it's elementary, but it's bigger than an entire hydrogen atom 125 times. The closest background to it is when you have other bosons that are not the Higgs boson, represented in gray, and you see they also have a shape. And this shape peaks at around 80 or 90. So already this mass is the best discriminant because 90 versus 125 
is different. But it's not a point, it has a distribution, and not only from our uncertainty of measuring it, but also from the quantum mechanics. A particle has a distribution of probability at being at 125, but sometimes it behaves as it's 100 or 140 with different probabilities. So these distributions are really coming from quantum mechanics and not just uncertainty of measurement. Now, when you look at the data that we measured after four years of data represented here in the quantity of data here, you see that the data points reproduce shape both in the area where there is more background and in the area where there is more signal. Because to make the plot simpler, we don't assign uncertainty to the simulation. We choose to assign uncertainty to the data. And that is a Poisson uncertainty because it is a count. And that's why every point has a vertical bar. And again, the theme of uncertainty. Because you look at them, not just saying the plots look close to the distribution of simulation, but how close they are. And one standard deviation is represented here by a vertical line. So you can see that most of the points fit very well close to the average. Some are a little bit below, some are a bit high. And when you look at one standard deviation, they agree quite well. Actually, this one doesn't agree quite well in one standard deviation, but agrees quite well in two standard deviations. And if you combine all of them, and you do that by adding their uncertainties in quadrature, which means Pythagoras theorem in the general case, and I will elaborate more on that, but it's very simple, you get the uncertainty on the end result. And basically already from this diagram, you see the concept of uncertainty, of simulation, of data, how you compare the two to each other, just as you do in an A-B test. You do a t-test to see how consistent is our hypothesis that there is no signal, meaning there is no red, or if there is a signal. And you can see that we can exclude the hypothesis, null hypothesis that there is no signal, because it should have been, the black dot should have been like here. But it's not, it's consistent with the signal. So this is, in a nutshell, how we discovered that the Higgs boson decays to bottom quarks in 2018. But let's look more into the numbers of the uncertainties. And we can see here two types of uncertainties, statistical uncertainty and systematical uncertainty. And then you add them to get a total uncertainty. To make a discovery, you need to make the final uncertainty to be very small. Here, this parameter mu means how many candidates of Higgs boson you see, you observe in the experiment, relative divided to the predictions of the theory. So ideally, it should be one. Now, you make a measurement that has this blue black line, always an uncertainty a confidence interval, and this is a one standard deviation. And you see that within one standard deviation, even if this dot is not exactly at one, the interval is within one. Okay. And you can see it's along the way. Sometimes here are three different channels that are combined to produce the final result. You have the zero lepton channel, one lepton channel, and two lepton channel. And you have two analyses. One is without machine learning, what we call cut-based analysis, and one is with machine learning, what we call multivariate analysis. And looking at this, we can draw several insights. Well, first of it, you have statistical error and systematic error. In the plot I showed before, these errors on the left and on the right, they are equal because it's a Gauss distribution. In real life, sometimes the distributions are not symmetric and you can have different values, 62 to 51 in this case, 37 to 33. In everyday life in the industry, we can assume they are equal. Second thing is, when you have two sources of uncertainty, you want to calculate independent of each other, you want to calculate the uncertainty on the total. How do you do that? And the answer is very simple. You apply Pythagoras theorem. So 0 0.30 squared plus 0 0.37 squared is 48 squared. I will elaborate more on that. But that's how you get to this number, which is the black. Now you can look, and because of Pythagoras theorem, it's not double. It's only, because these are close to each other, it's only 1.4. 
That's why the most of the uncertainty comes from statistical and having the systematic uncertainty only improves by a little bit. Or the other way around, the systematic uncertainty is big and adding just the statistical uncertainty, it's a little bit of that. But some channel is, is more accurate than other. For example, this two lepton is better than this one. So always you have different ways that are bigger or smaller. Now, when you combine also adding in quadrature, zero lepton, one lepton, and two lepton, you get these numbers. And you can see they're both consistent with one. Okay. Now, you also see by eye that the uncertainty on the multivariate analysis, the machine learning, is smaller than the one for without machine learning. So already there is an impact. Machine learning helps us reduce the error. And by reducing the error, make us more confident in our interval and how much confidence it is this is another formula if you measure something which is 106 and it has an uncertainty let's say 035 you just divide the two and you get the number of standard deviations that you're far away from the origin which is three so see how simple it is you measure something you measure its error you divide the two and you get the standard deviations in finance that is called the sharp ratio, so it's the same concept. Or you can call that significance of the result, is the same thing. Or in statistics, you call that the z-score. And if the distribution is not symmetric, but a bit with some tails, you call that the t-score, and you do a t-test instead of a z-test. But really, what the message here is that you can do it by eye, just calculating an average, and calculating an uncertainty to it and plotting it on the line relative to zero and you can see do i make a profit or do i do not make a profit i can compare two values is there an uplift from method b relative to method a and for your stakeholders from c level from operational managers that's all you need to show the number the error the plot they see visually and you can convert it to a probability and say it's 95 percent or one percent chance to be wrong so three standard deviations evidence for in 2018 for combining three analysis without using machine learning we can have evidence for the higgs boson that we obtained at fermilab in 2011 using machine learning and using advanced techniques and combining the analysis uh, so see how much it advanced because CERN had more data, which meant statistical error became smaller. And we understood better the detector because it's a newer detector, 20 years newer, more advanced, which also reduces systematical uncertainty. But it's uncertainty that tells us the confidence. And if we use machine learning, you divide 116 to 027 and you get 4.3 we are so much more confident from one in 1,000, maybe here you are one in 100,000 to be wrong. And I said we may discover it five standard deviation. Why is that? Well, the trick is here, we have VH, Higgs boson produced together with a, with a vector boson, but there are other ways it was produced and we combined all the way the Higgs boson can be produced, but always decaying to bottom quarks, so Higgs to BB, the 4.3 became five standard deviations. So this is how, this di plot can tell us so many things. We add uncertainties in quadrature from, from here to here to get a total, and from 0, 1, and 2 to get a total here, and adding MVA, machine learning, improves further and brings value. And by the end of the talk, we will quantify how much money it saved CERN by using machine learning and reducing this error. How did we use machine learning? It's actually very simple. It's a classification problem of supervised to separate signal to background so that you increase the ratio of signal to background if you make a cut, a selection on the discriminant, so on the output of the machine learning. Replacing just having a cut on the mass. So here, if you have a cut where the gray shape becomes smaller, you, you remain with more signal than background. So this is, this is method A, the cut-based analysis, make a cut here. The second way is have a discriminant and make a cut on the discriminant. And discriminant would make signal more to the right and background more to the left. And the best discriminant is this mass from the cut-based analysis. So the cut-based analysis plus a few more variables make the input to a boosted decision tree 
We used XGBoost. It's a library also developed at CERN, very versatile. Currently in the industry, it's replaced by LightGBM because it's 10 times faster. And, uh, you know, techniques have evolved uh, since the last 10 years. And that's how you do it. A word on these variables that are in addition. Sometimes in the industry, you're given 1,000 variables and you're asked to select the best features, the most correlated, principal component analysis, dimensionality reduction. In our case, these variables come from human knowledge developed over 20 years of which variable is mostly correlated with our signal. So really featured, engineered by, by humans. But sometimes in the industry, you need to do analysis to calculate from many potential variables the ones that are mostly correlated with your output. But this is not enough. There is a lot of work to measure that uncertainty that I presented on the previous slides. And I'm zooming here on the diagrams of uncertainties on the total final analysis. And we have this number, which is 0 0.25 on that number one, right? So already you can see here, it's a four standard deviation just on, on this one. And this is made of two components, statistical, which is 161 and systematic, which is 203. And together you can make the calculation. They give you the, the number. It can be a third digit small change, but it is really the Pythagoras theorem because you can safely assume that statistical uncertainty and systematical uncertainty are not correlated with each other. And this is one formula I would like you to remember and take home in your life in the industry, in a company, that if you have two phenomena, you add the uncertainties on them with a plus. But it's also the same formula when you have a minus, and the minus you use more often when you compare two methods. One method has 10 euro plus or minus one euro. The other method has nine euro plus or minus one euro. Which method is better? Well, the uplift or the difference is one euro. And what's the error on that one euro? Well, it's one euro from one, one euro from the other one, the result is 140. So I have one euro uplift with a 140 error. The error is bigger than my value. So therefore it's consistent with zero. It touches the zero. So therefore you say, no, there is no statistical significant, no statistically significant difference. And I cannot say that one method is better than the other. And you as a manager should not act on it. So when we say data-driven actionable insights, we should know which to act on and which we should ignore. This is the key message. And it comes from very simple, but we need to be aware of this and use it. Also, the systematic uncertainties have various types that require a lot of work. Everybody does a little bit of side work. I mean, not a bit, a big component besides the main data analysis of side work measuring somebody the error on the measuring the electrons the b tagging and so on and this you also add in quadrature this means adding in quadrature you have a lot of them so you have a square plus b square plus c square plus d square and you get this number of 203. cool so now we know how to measure the uncertainty and how to propagate when we have a difference or a sum of many effects Let's derive another insight from these numbers. We already see that the analysis is already statistically limited. It looks like a fancy word. What does it mean? Well, it just means that the statistical error, 161, is smaller than the systematic error, 203. That means that if I add more data, meaning if I let CERN operate for an infinity of years, right with all the cost that comes from that i reduce the statistical error because statistical error is reduced by adding more data so therefore this error is reduced to zero what's my total error it's zero squared plus this one squared take the square root of that it's exactly this one so you you go from 0 0.25 to 0 0.20 you cannot make it smaller than 0 0.20 unless you reduce the systematical error. And the systematical error, you resolve it by doing a lot of complex analysis, calibrations in control regions, in regions where you have negligible signals. So basically, everyone's PSGD is reducing the systematical uncertainty in one corner or the other. It can be on one measurement of a particle or on the final analysis. That's why you need hundreds of people 
full five years of PhD and postdoctoral to reduce this error. The statistical error is reduced by us by CERN. CERN is the laboratory that makes the acceleration for us and provides the protons. So you can reduce the statistical error by adding more years of CERN operation. The question is, and this is the second formula I would like you to take home today, is how does the statistical error gets reduced if we increase the data? And the formula is the formula of the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of the mean divided by square root of n, the number of samples in the mean. So basically it's one over square root of n. That means that if I make the error, the sample four times larger, I improved by two times, which means my error is at half. And if I increase by 50% the sample, I improve by 22%. And it turns out from the previous numbers that I showed you with cut-based analysis versus the machine learning that we improve by 22%, which basically is 50%. How many years did we use in this analysis that you saw there? We used four years of data, what was called the run two, uh, something from 2013, 14 to 2017, and we analyzed in 2018. So four years of data. What is 50% more of four years? Two more years. So basically, we saved CERN two years of operations. If we didn't have the machine learning to reduce the systematical error by 25%, we would have needed to reduce the sample size, the statistical error, by 25%, which means we should have had 50% more data, which means CERN should have operated for two more years. So we basically saved everyone two years of their life using machine learning. Now, how much does it cost for CERN? CERN consumes a lot of energy. It has two nuclear power plants to operate it on the order of 250 million euros per year, just in the operational cost for energy. So that is half a billion saved from using machine learning. Of course, it's not just us. Every team doing searching dark matter, black holes, or just measuring the standard model also use machine learning. And each of them by also made similar improvements and each of them saved. So it's not just my analysis alone saved CERN, but all of us together benefited by much for machine learning to save years of operations. And it's not just money, but it's year of personal life. And in academia, it's a very intense work and you make personal sacrifices in order to discover this. So if you finish your PhD of four years, then you move to a postdoctoral position to get this extra two years to make the search. And sometimes it gets more years. That means you get married later, you have children later. So the whole family is put on pause and machine learning at the same time can help you. You have children earlier because now you discover the Higgs boson earlier. So the impact of machine learning is, is very important, but you need to quantify that with uncertainties. So with that being said, I think these are the two formulas I want you to remember. Standard error, it's over square root of n, and error propagation from Pythagoras theorem, and we can exemplify it in the world of companies, machine, industry. And I will exemplify from Tia Mobility, where I work, where we let people rent electric scooters, electric e-bikes from an app, from a phone app, and people take them from anywhere in the street and they can leave them anywhere in the street. In some countries, there are regulations and you take them from only chosen places by the city authorities. But overall, there is always a movement of many vehicles around the city, day and night, and in order to operate, you need sometimes, you need every day to move a small fraction, small few percent, less than 5% of your fleet. Because people tend to move vehicles from the good locations, let's say a train station. Sometimes they go back to the train station. Sometimes they go to the restaurant. From a restaurant, somebody else picks them in somewhere else. And at some point, they end up at somebody's house and that person doesn't use it again. So if you don't move them every day a little bit, you would end up with all the vehicles in the periphery or in places they will not be used. 
it's a bit like you have to clean your house every day a little bit of dust or every three days or every week you decide but the more often you do the more you can afford to to clean a little bit and that is what we do with every day or twice three times a day with shift in shifts of eight hours there are people on the street with vans that pick vehicles from bad locations and move them to good locations and in the process also swap their batteries because it's electric vehicles and their battery is used even if people are not using it because there is a small computer on board there is a there is a gps there is an internet of things that measures acceleration and sends signal back to us so you can go on the phone and open the app the and the vehicle unlocks and you can ride it so this is where i work i build algorithms and not just algorithms i put them in production via data products and not just data products but engineering products because these recommendations go into the app another app for our employees in the street and they see the map of the city with dots representing the vehicles color coded by priority and the tasks they should act on them pick up from here drop there swap the battery and then in order to reduce cost to increase revenue and overall be profitable you need to prioritize you need to choose which of this multitude of tasks you should do because you can have so many combinations there are so many vehicles that need a battery swap should i do it at 90 percent? should i do it at 30 percent? should i do it at five percent you know there is always some optimum value if you leave it at five percent people start the ride and the battery dies in the road and it's not a good experience if you swap at 90 percent, it's too early you should wait maybe 50 maybe 30 who knows and it depends on the situation maybe in the city center you want to swap the batteries more often because people use them more often and get used more often maybe in the periphery you swap them more rarely and maybe once you swap you also move it to a better place which could be the city center but these decisions are taken usually by humans based on their intuition city center is better periphery is worse but what if you have a train line in the periphery and that becomes a local hub of first mile last mile because people go from there to their home for 15 minutes because they don't have a bus or metro afterwards so then maybe your intuition also says you to put there but when it's such a big city at scale like capitals of cities humans may not have the best decisions because maybe they went there a few times in the summer and now it's winter and the situations have changed and, and they don't know or maybe a new bar has appeared and all the teenagers go there and then you don't know about it because you never leave you never go in that neighborhood but the data will start to show it to us because more app openings in this area more vehicles end up there and then they start there and that's why we look at data at scale it's not the nothing intelligent about artificial intelligence right it's just statistics things at scale and that's what we are doing to automate the decision making of humans or improve upon them the human can be in the loop can be fully automated it depends on the business problem but our help our role is to improve the business the decision with the help of data and that means again with the uncertainty so I build data products and the data products are based on two things machine learning forecasts in time and space geospatial for every corner of the city and weather and so on so basically forecasting demand and supply and this become input to an optimization with constraints telling us which of the tasks we should do our first instinct when we go to the industry and we are just beginning and we are junior data scientists we want to jump on the data analyze the data and make a machine learning prediction and then we deal with kpis precision recall for classification or accuracy if you combine them or regression rmse or mape smape and others but what i want to convey to you is that this is really the last one that matters and matters for the business matters for the sea level matters for our stakeholders but should also matter to you because you don't just want to make a machine learning that went from 90 percent accuracy to 95 percent accuracy you want to say on your cv 
and to yourself that you made an impact. And the impact can be the value. I saved so many car rides by replacing them with electric vehicles, which reduce pollution. So that's what we call operational KPIs. Or you want to say, I brought the company 1 million euros with a confidence of 100,000 euros. And that is business KPI. And your managers would matter about 1 million. And you say, you brought us 1 million, maybe we will give you a raise, maybe we'll give you a promotion. So it's very important to think of these three types of KPIs. Business KPIs, where you optimize revenue, so how much money the company makes, or you reduce the cost by making things more efficient, or the difference between them, which is the profit margins. And there are different types of them. There is operational profit margin. Then you take into account the, all the profits, all the costs, and you make EBITDA, or you make the full cost with interest rates, and you have the full profit. There are different degrees of profit. And as a company goes from losing money startup to profitable, it goes from being first operational profitable, then EBITDA profitable, then fully profitable. And it depends on which stage of the company you are in. Usually when a startup starts, you want to grow at all costs. Uh, investors gives you money, they want you to acquire market share, and therefore have a lot of revenue. Even if you acquire that revenue with a huge cost. But later, as the situation hardens financially, like we have now with higher interest rates, focus is on cost and you want to reduce the cost. And again, machine learning can help by making many choices, making the best choices to act on from the multitude of possibilities. And then finally, you want the revenue minus cost to be, to be optimized. So you can optimize, maybe the revenue increases a little bit, but cost decreases more. So you have the balance between them. And it's up talking to your stakeholders from operations, from C-level, that, that you learn which metric is more important now for the company. And that's why you have to be very business driven to follow up what the company is doing, what is their target, how well they do in revenue, how do you do in cost, and maybe you can even suggest yourself on which topic to work on. Of course, as you get more senior to, to, to mid-level, to, to, to senior data scientists, to staff data scientists, to principal, data dp or so on right so the more senior you want you, you become you want to have more impact and understand these kpis and make input to the decision of which kpis should be tackled and what can data offer maybe it can offer solution in one and not in the other once you chose if you want revenue or cost or profit then you should choose your operational kpis which in our case is shift efficiency how many tasks are done in a shift how many vehicles are get the rentals after we drop them you do asset management in general or if you work on the consumer side customer side it's customer conversion from the funnel of joining our website to to making our first purchase or churn rates what is the rate that people give up on our product and you want to reduce that so all of them are operational kpis anything about not money is operational kpi things with money is business kpi and my message is you should think in terms of money because you want to make an impact. And then translate to operational KPIs. Okay, but in practice, how do we get the money? Oh, by making more rentals. And in the process, dropping the vehicles in such a way as they are maybe closer together that within the same shift of eight hours with the van, now you dropped 10 vehicles instead of eight. And those extra two will also make money, right? So you reduce cost and increase revenue. And only at the very last time you do the machine learning KPIs. And sometimes, as I had in my experience, it's not worth improving the machine learning model at all because you are limited by constraints coming from this side of operations, such as even if you had a perfect model. So then you will make an A-B testing and you'll simulate, what if I have a perfect model? How much will my operational KPIs change? Oh, not at all. How much would the business change? How much money? Not at all. Well, then I should not invest in machine learning. Not yet. First, I should improve the constraints that are here and then see that if I have a perfect model, what would be my, my impact? And this is how I really applied it. At scale, to 200 cities, two, three times per day, there is a shift that chooses which tasks to be, to be optimized by basically people in the street. And I do that by doing machine learning time series forecasts that are retrained daily, one for demand and one for supply. And of course, it has time variables like day of the week, 
month of the year, hour of the day, if it's holiday or not, if it's weekend or not, and so on. Location, latitude and longitude, like different pots, uh, points on this map. And then you can put helping data, like how is the weather today? Are there public transport nearby? Are there points of interest, like tourist places where people go a lot, a shopping mall? And then we, so we count initially demand and supply every hour in one each of these hexagons. And we use a public library created by Uber that is known in the industry and everybody's using it. And you can divide the entire planet in these hexagons that are unique and given a point, you know, in which hexagon it belongs. And given a hexagon, you know what are its uh, edges and so on. And from this, we make predictions. What would be the demand? What would be the supply? And then we make the difference between them in balance for the next 24 hours, for example, or three days or a week. And that will tell you, oh, I should bring three vehicles here. I should move two vehicles from here. This is a very interesting area. I should swap the batteries here more often than the other ones. So it allows you to improve these business KPIs and operational KPIs, which for us, it's more rights to get or to get more to customers like tourists. And in the winter, for example, you focus more on the local tourists. In the summer, you focus more on, on more tourists, right? So on customer acquisition. So in the summer, you want more revenue. In the winter, you want more profit and reduce the cost. So these KPIs change also throughout the year. That's why you want to build data products that are malleable, that, that, that are scalable, that, that you can reuse them. You can change the KPI, the, AP, the KPI at the end, of the optimization layer and produces everything. And, and finally, we have the optimization that from thousands of vehicles says, in this shift, you should move this 100 because you have three people on the van and each one can get 33 vehicles, for example. So we recommend vehicle pickups, vehicle where to drop, and battery swapping. And I say optimization with constraints. This is a very important topic. And the more mature the company is, the more it gets to this level. Initially, it stop, stops with demand and supply, and then human takes some decision by hand or make just this difference, naive difference, and this is what to move. But really, the next level is optimization with constraints, what's called operations research. There are OR, operational research tools. And luckily, all of these are done in Python. There are libraries. You just need to use them. And we can have constraints from the city's authorities, like fixed parking places, the maximum number of scooters to put in one place, or you can have constraints from our operational teams. How many drivers I have today? How many vans? How many scooters can I put in a shift? It's roughly 20, 25. How many batteries can I put? It's roughly 45. You cannot put more because they can explode, right? There is safety uh, regulations. So that's why, and this, as you see, come from the business. And again, the message is be very close to the business. Talk to your stakeholders from operations, from sea level, understand what's important from them. Because in the end, it's these operational KPIs and business KPIs that matter to be improved, not the machine learning. Machine learning has an input to it, right? And let's come back to the uncertainties. Every measurement has an uncertainty the same way every prediction of machine learning should have an uncertainty that you propagate using that Pythagoras theorem, right? A squared plus B squared equals the uncertainty on the difference, because that's what you want, difference of demand minus supply. And with that uncertainty, you decide if I act on it. If I have one vehicle difference with three vehicle error, there is no difference. But if I have four vehicle difference with two vehicle error, great, it's more than zero. Then I will trust and act on the four. So on some you act, on some you don't act. And even that four becomes an input here. And in the end, you need to propagate this to have an uncertainty on your revenue and say, do these methods and you gain two euros plus or minus 10 cents on this method A. And on the other method, you have three euros plus or minus 10 cents. So you say, what's the uplift? Oh, it's one euro difference with 10 error and 10 error cents. The square is one is 14 cents, Pythagoras theorem. And now you say one euro divided by 14, it's seven. Seven is seven standard deviations. I'm better than CERN in this confidence. So I will make this choice. In reality, it's harder than that, right? You have one, you have two euro and three euro and one has 30 cents error and the other has 30 cents error and the difference is 60 cents. And now you have a one plus or minus 60 cents 
and now you are 1.5 standard deviation. So you're somewhere at 80% and your management has to decide, do I act on this 80% or not? And usually companies are confident with anything about one standard deviation. But that's why it's important to have the standard deviation on the final money. And for this, you need the standard deviation on the initial demand and supply forecasts. And for this, luckily there is a tool and, and, and a method called conformal prediction that started in 2011. This is a paper that I encourage you to read. And there are tons of resources nowadays. And this is something recent made, um, you know, just a few weeks ago, it was advertised on LinkedIn by I recover to do there. And this is curated list of awesome videos, tutorials, papers, code, open source, everything. So I encourage you to do here, study it. And actually it's again, it's very simple. Once you have it, there's Python library, it's fast, it's easy. You just need to think, change your mind to think about it and incorporate conformal prediction in your forecasts. So to conclude, to have a successful career in data science, you need to build data products at scale. And of course, that means coding, that means data engineering, that means machine learning engineering with a cloud, with SQL, and that was not the topic of my code, of, of my talk today. Of course, those should be done. My focus of the talk was that in order to make the insights to be actionable, with the help of data, data-driven actionable insights, we need to allow the business and us to know if you can act on them. And that means have an uncertainty, have a confidence interval, and that comes from statistics. And while statistics is frightening, it doesn't have to be. There is only Pythagoras theorem for error propagation, apply conformal predictions to put uncertainty on your point predictions, and then error propagate that with Pythagoras theorem to the final result. And really work only on topics that are crucial for the business, not on nice to have, and calculate yourself the impact that you make on the final money. Don't wait for your manager to do it or for your stakeholder, calculate it yourself and present it yourself to them. And that's why through influencing without authority, with data storytelling, you convince them to use your tool because they see with confidence that you can earn 1 million plus or minus 100,000. So at 95% confidence, they make at least 800,000, more than your salary, and therefore, they're happy to do that and maybe give you a raise and a promotion. So it's good for your career to work on things that are very crucial to the business and calculate the KPIs yourself and have them ready in advance. And any time there is a sudden need for somebody to ask for this, you have them already re ready. And with that, I thank you for your, your attention and I would be happy to, to take your questions. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. So interesting from the very beginning. Uh, I um, I remind when, the, as I told you at the beginning, when the X boson was discovered, I'm on the theoretical side, so uh, I was not into the all the statistics and all the details. Uh, I was not even understanding really them as a theoretical physicist, but uh, I, I remember that that period. And um, then super interesting um, that again with. Uh, very simple mathematics um, because statistics at, at least the fundamental statistic is very very simple mathematics this is so powerful in many many different fields from obviously uh, particle physics science in general but also and uh, maybe even more uh, for business reason in in the industry but really it's just about uh, uh, squaring numbers, uh, uh, simple, simple theorems, uh, stuff like that, but so powerful. Um, I think um, one point, okay, it's very simple mathematics, but you need to get used and understand when to use it. Because sometimes you have the problem there, but you, you don't know if you are not sure if uh, I should use this one or this or this other. And this is about experience, you need to, to practice and reading, uh, see tutorials, so on and so forth. So th thank you again. And um, I saw in the chat that there was a question, but feel free to unmute yourself and ask to Adrian, uh, whatever. I wanted to ask actually for us that we have 
never seen Higgs boson data set, but we are used to titanium data set where we have some rows and columns with some futures. Uh, and we have an LSTM prediction, how we actually, uh, because you are saying that for any models, like any LSTM or any LMs, we can always get a confidence or a standard deviation. Is that right? Yes. This is. But how do we do it? Like we get the we get the prediction, and then we have average out, and we calculate the confidence. Intuitively, a machine learning is not intelligent. It just looks at similar situations in the past and it averages out, it gives you a prediction that is similar to the true target of similar situations in the past, right? So in our case, uh, if you are in an area of the city in similar day of the week, the same hour, it will basically take what was doing there and doing an average. So intuitively, in in place in in the in this phase space a virtual space right of possibilities that happened a lot in the past you will get a result that is confident that is low uncertainty just this one over square root of n of statistics right because it's as if you average a sample that is larger but in some situations where it has only few samples then the error would be larger because maybe this were just some accident to be here and the true value is somewhere else and when you actually predict the true value would be somewhere else so the the error would be larger and in and in some situations you are completely outside your your field so you have extrapolation and interpolation if you have two numbers in between them interpolate right and that's what machine learning does it can be a linear regression or machine learning it interpolates it not doesn't extrapolate so it cannot tell you anything so it cannot tell you anything of confidence of things that it doesn't see so be, see before however the neural network or a decision tree would always give you back a number it won't tell you i'm not confident in this. it would always tell you a number and if you act on it blindly you will make mistakes because you will invest 1 million euros in something that never happened before never tested and then you lose it right so therefore you need to to find the situations that are inside and outside okay so this is intuitively right now historically this was done with bootstrapping meaning you have some you train many models many many thousands of them and every time you make a selection you know a sampling with replacement of your sample so you, you choose some of them and some of them can be more often some of them can be more rare depending how they are and then each of them has a prediction and you average out all of these predictions and you get some feeling and this would and if the and if this distribution is very wide then you have a large error if it's small you have a small error now the issue with that is two things one of them is like it's very slow instead of training once you need to train thousand times and second thing is it's also not scientifically fully accurate because you can still have some bias in your sampling now conformal prediction became more wide known 2021 in the data science field so very recent but it already has been advanced a lot code libraries in python and that's what it does it basically does a little bit what we did in the higgs boson right has an area of control sample of little signal has an area of of less signal but in the areas that you can control, you can do some normalization. And with this, so basically, instead of having train and test, you have train validation and test, like you should do like hyperparameter Turing validation. But in this validation sample, you basically do this calibration that gives you some shape. And based on that shape, you, you, you reconfigure your predictions to incorporate this error. So you kind of evaluate this error in this validation, and then you you believe this error will go also in the test sample this is in a nutshell but i really encourage you to to read this paper and there are also blogs on medium and youtube so, so there are even smaller simpler resources and, and 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 look at this and try a hello world for one of your classification uh, regression and classification it's in general and it can be for lstm time series it can be for uh, decision trees 
And in general, especially for forecasts, because people care how many customers I have tomorrow, how many how many ingredients should I buy to have to have to produce my product, right? All about supply chain, about statistics, about logistics. It's about time series that is very important. What will happen next day, next month, so that I can buy my procurement, right? And then you want to put an uncertainty to it. And, and then that's one easy way to do it. And, and not just easy, but scientifically proven with theorems that it's it has a full coverage of, of that phase space. So you it, it's more trustable numbers of uncertainties. Thank you very much. I'm very convinced about it now. So, so maybe we make a community and we show our, our examples, how we, how we try it out later. Feel free yeah. if uh, you have any other question or curiosity. So I have one. It's more about uh, curiosity uh, on uh, uh x because i remember that uh, maybe you can spend some words more it's curious that the uh, x uh, uh, discover theoretically discover uh, the x boson using this uh, let's say framework which is called uh, quantum field theory and in particular the standard model of particle physics which is a mathematical framework uh, where you can uh, uh, let's say do prediction, uh, compute uh, uh, scattering probabilities between particles, uh, and um, in particular the mechanism you discover the X boson. It's called uh, uh, spontaneously uh, broken symmetries, which is a mechanism in physics where you have a symmetry, but is spontaneously broken. The symmetry um, when when you are uh, going from a high energy physics from a lower energy uh, there are symmetries that are broken um, and in, in this mechanism is where the x boson uh, let's say arise uh, so uh, x uh, was was able to calculate all this stuff and predict this uh, this particle but if i'm not wrong at a certain point he decided to quit with uh, theoretical physics or or research, and for several years, he, he, he didn't update himself on it. I, am I correct, Adrian, or it's just a, lead, a legend that X uh, at a certain point decided to quit with theoretical physics? Yeah, it's it's very it's very very true what you say with spontaneously breaking the electroweak symmetry, and that's what yeah. Higgs mechanism does um basically um distinguishing between the photon that has a mass of zero and the double and the z boson that is neutral as well which has a huge mass of this 90 i showed on on the plot there and the fact that these two particles are different that makes that electromagnetic force the light is different from the weak one yeah is different from the weak ones that have uh, nuclear decays and nuclear decays are only in the nucleus because the Z yeah. boson is very heavy, so it propagates at a distance, one over its mass, so a small distance that is the size of the nucleus of the atom. Whereas the photon, one over its mass, mass is zero, one over zero is infinity, it means the photon can go to infinity and reach the edge of the universe, and that's why I see light coming from the yeah. end stars. Uh, Peter Higgs did these studies, um, these ideas when he was very young, right, like soon as he became professor in the 20s late 20s early 30s and and after that there is not a lot of progress in the in the in the in the i mean the standard model was was confirmed right it was a lot of progress in the 50s i mean the standard model was confirmed already by the 60s but the final parts like three families were discovered gradually in the 60s 70s even 80s and during that time, there wasn't something revolutionary new. And while he was a professor, no, I think he was a professor continuously, but but he didn't have much 
further success yeah. like what else can you publish so you know there was some tensions maybe with the university that that what are you doing anymore uh maybe he was asked to leave for a moment or he took some long leave to think about it but in the end things came back and he came back but and, and he and he's a you know a smart professor but at the same time he did everything when he was very young and then he had to wait for his theory to be confirmed and as time approached there are different generations of experiments that uh, were hoping to find a Higgs boson, but basically turned out to have a, such a large mass, high mass, that you needed more energy. So you eliminate, it's like a microscope, right? It's like a zoom in, the more energy, the more you zoom in. So it's like, oh, it's not up to here. It's not up to here. It's not up to here. Until they finally reach, reach CERN and they said, we need to calculate what how many energy should we put in? How many collisions in such a way to answer these questions once and for all? Um, even if it's infinity, we should see it, right? And and that's how it was designed. And that's why CERN was very successful. It was not by accident. It was by design. It took 10 years mm -hmm. to design the detector, 10 years to build, and then another 10 years of data analysis. Um, and this is also parallel to our business work. We should also estimate how much data should I collect for my A-B testing experiment that compares two methods in such a way as to give statistically significant confidence is method A better than method B, right? Um, and that's what CERN is. And that's what's called the power prediction of this. And, 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 and you play with these uncertainties and that tells you, oh, I should calculate so much N so that my error reduced by one over square root of N, right? Uh, so that it and, and this has a t there's a t test formula but if you look at it it's one over square root of n so that's the intuition i want you to 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 to, to keep from that it's just that more data means lower error and you can think about it four times the data i get two times more precise how many precise many times precise so do this uh, what they call back up the envelope calculation because if you do them well yeah. you make decision fast you you tell them and you train your managers to also think like that within your company um so that they are convinced if something is actionable or not. Okay, thank you. Now I really need to leave you because I need to, to join, uh, as I told the other person, but if there is um, maybe last question or whatever, feel free uh, to go on. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much, Adrian. And next time, maybe for Just Among Us, uh, because I'm also curious about uh, uh, another big topic in particle physics uh, is supersymmetry that has a similar, um, uh, uh, let, let's say, problem uh, at CERN uh, that people thought that the energy was, was close to, 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 uh, to uh, reach any supersymmetrical particle, but this does, doesn't, doesn't happen, uh, didn't happen, haven't yet so, so, so far. Uh, so uh, there was also a crisis in particle physics for, for this reason. But it's in another topic, Let, let's keep the other outside physics that maybe they are more interested in AI and it's already late <laughs> and I also need to go. But again, thank you again and um, uh, see you, I, if I'm not wrong, see you in two weeks here at my campus. Yes, happy to, to, to talk to you okay. then in person and thank you everyone for the audience today.